Welcome to What's Treading with Tire Review, presented by Apex 2021. I'm Maddie Weiner, and today on the podcast, we're joined by Ron Papkun, Senior Vice President of Operations for Sumitomo Rubber North America. Ron, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you. So um, since the pandemic has started, I know SRNA has hosted dealer forums to inform dealers about the market, supply and demand, and the performance of different tire segments. Uh, in February, I know you were on one of those dealer forums, um, and you said it's one of the most challenging environments we've seen in 20 years on the inbound shipping side of the industry. Can you describe what manufacturers are experiencing and what SRNA has faced? Sure. It certainly has been challenging, and unfortunately, while we have seen some slight improvements in the situation, we're continuing to experience those challenges even today. So let me start, I'll break it down into two components. Um, first on the Asian side, because we do import a fairly good amount of our product from Asia. And then I'll talk about what's happening on the US side because we have challenges really on both sides. On the Asia side, uh, we are seeing spot rates uh, remaining elevated. Uh, depending on whether you're shipping with contract or if you're out there in the market, certainly you're probably paying more to ship a container of tires here than you were a year ago. Um, spot rates right now are in excess of $4,000 per container. In some cases, maybe five, maybe up to 6,000. I've heard anecdotally um, spot rates as high as $10,000 per container. That would be on the extreme side. Um, in addition to that, we're still seeing delays on the Asian side in terms of loading up to one week or more, which is significant because when you add up the total time it takes from getting your bookings done to getting your loading, any types of stops along the way in transit, getting the goods to the US side, getting them outdated, the supply chain lead time tends to be fairly long. So every time you add a week here, a week there, before you know, you have a significant amount of delays. So what we're seeing really from the ocean side is service levels are low. The schedule reliability is low in terms of on time and blank sailings are up. And blank sailings just basically mean to try and get back on schedule, those ocean carriers have to skip a port of call. So then that means there's more freight that's building up there that didn't get picked up, which will require um, some additional services next time around, which would then throw that part of it out of whack. So. Basically, um, we're out of sync on the um, carrier side, which is the ocean freight carriers. In some cases, we're seeing that they're prioritizing higher paying cargo, which may have an impact on tire importers, to be perfectly honest, because you know the tire industry is in the mix with everybody else competing for capacity and resources. And in some cases, in particular, with high margin products like iPhones and electronics, Peloton bikes, they may be willing to pay more for ocean freight uh, than a tire company would. Um, in addition to that, to kind of compound the situation, we're still seeing containers are in short supply. And the situation is basically they've got containers accumulated on the US side now, still trying to get those back to Asia, just due to the total demand. They don't have enough containers to move um, the product from Asia to the U.S. So in some cases, they're shipping those containers back empty. It's forcing uh, the importers in the U.S. and the shippers from Asia to use alternate methods of getting the goods here. Now, longer term, we do expect that the situation will normalize and that carriers will add vessel capacity. Um, but that won't happen um, probably the soonest would be 2022. So for the balance of 2021, uh, we do anticipate, you know, there will be challenges. You will probably pay more to get product here from Asia. All right, so that's the Asian side. Interesting. On the other side, um, we have seen some sides of improvement, but there's still many challenges going on. I'm sure you're aware there's heavy congestion at the ports. You know, as the situation unfolded, obviously importers, um, they try to diversify which ports they're using. Um, that just has a follow on effect of just moving the congestion around. Um, LA Long Beach continues to be one of the most challenging, um, primarily because of the volume and in particular, the volume coming from Asia. So we still have ships anchored 
at port waiting to be unloaded. Um, we're also seeing mainly inland, but in general, there are shortages of chassis. And all these things are just kind of related um, to the fact that we've got more cargo coming in than the system can handle at this time. So ironically, um, in addition to all these issues, some of the shipping lines are not accepting empty containers back. And I say ironically, because they need to get those containers back to Asia so that they can move more goods. The problem is since the containers are in balance and the majority of them are on the US side, they're full. So they have too many empty containers. So I guess my next question is what, what led to these challenges? You know, why are we where we are today? And, and are tariffs influencing these, uh, these challenges that are happening in the supply chain right now? Well, in some ways, despite the challenges, um, what we're experiencing really from my perspective are growing pains. So even though the problem itself is on the supply side in terms of capacity to move the product, the actual root cause is demand. And that's actually a good problem to have. So it doesn't really feel good. Um, but the bottom line is the rapid acceleration um, of the economy in the US and to a lesser degree other economies is what's driving this record volume and capacity to move these goods is pretty much fixed. Um, in fact, probably got um, deprioritized due to COVID. So we kind of just went from one extreme to the other with this V-shaped recovery that we have. As an example, if you look at the forecast for GDP growth in the US, it's looking like the upward potential of that forecast is to have double digit GDP growth in the United States, which is one of the two largest economies in the world. That's kind of unprecedented at this stage of the game for a developed economy like the United States. And so what happens is with that kind of demand, you know, a rising tide, it tends to lift all ships. So this isn't unique just to the tire industry. Obviously, um, companies in the United States across the board are all facing, you know, similar type of situation. So rising tide lifts all ships, or in this case, it fills all ships and then some, um, and we just can't get the capacity. So my guess would be that the majority of companies, um, despite how much they don't like the situation, are seeing significant sales growth in their business. Um, in some cases, record sales growth, which is really kind of the silver lining to this story. Um, secondarily, the United States reliance on imported goods and materials just puts stress on a system that has relatively fixed capacity. So this is not new. It's not gonna be easily solved. It's gonna take time um, for it to work itself out. And, you know, in particular, when it comes to either increasing manufacturing capacity or increasing transportation capacity on ocean when it comes to vessels, those are highly capital intensive businesses. And I know when it comes to making investment in those businesses, there's some long-term considerations. And what we're experiencing right now is a very short-term jolt to the system. Um, clearly, we cannot sustain this level of growth. Um, so I think at some point, just like has happened in the past, there will be equalization between supply and demand. Uh, I just think for the balance of 2021, it's going to be a challenge. In regards to the tariffs, tariffs probably aren't having a huge effect. The other thing, at least at Falcon, we have not seen a significant decline in demand for our imported products, um, despite the tariffs being implemented. So we do continue um, to see demand for those products, but I think longer term, the intent of the tariffs could help the situation by encouraging some companies to reconsider their um, strategy on onshoring and localizing their production in the United States, which is really the ultimate goal. It just, if you look at the numbers today and how much the US imports, despite everything that has happened you know, over the past eight to 10 years to try and address the situation, uh, we just continue to import record amounts of goods. Yeah, very interesting. So, so you're saying that, you know, before COVID, uh, there was a certain capacity that the tire industry was used to having domestically. And then um, 
after COVID, a demand spike and that, that capacity changed, it needed to grow. So we're having this, um, I guess this mix up right now, would that be fair to say? Well, I can tell you, at least from our side, exactly what happened. And I would say this probably applies to the entire industry. Uh -huh. Almost a year ago is when we started to see the rapid deceleration and shutdown of the US economy related to COVID. The stock market was collapsing, plants were closing down, the economy was closing down. You know, people tend to be fearful, they go into panic mode, but just uh, from a real numbers perspective, demand was definitely falling off and it was falling off rapidly. Um, there wasn't a lot of information about what was gonna happen at that point in time. So I can tell you during the second quarter of 2020, with the shutdowns and the reduction in demand, us, like most likely the majority of tire companies in the United States significantly scaled back on the amount of tires that they were producing and ordering. That created a gap in the supply chain. For at least 60 to 90 days, we did not produce enough tires because no one was anticipating that starting in June, things would immediately start reaccelerating and not only reaccelerating, accelerating at a rate that was higher than they were before we went into COVID. So mm -hmm. now we basically have to rebuild two to three months worth of inventory reductions that were made in the second quarter of 2020, which if you look at the size of the tire market in the United States, which I believe is roughly around 250 million tires for aftermarket, plus your OE tires, all other channels, that's a lot of product. And with the production capacity being relatively fixed and um, with the constraints we're seeing on transportation and now even constraints we're seeing on raw materials, it's just gonna take us a while to catch up. Got it, very interesting. So yeah, and um, kind of leads me to my next question. You know, dealers have told us it's no surprise that their fill rates are down, but it's because of these, these challenges. Um, what other consequences has the industry seen at all levels of the supply chain because of shipping challenges? And how has SRNA responded? I can talk a little bit about the fill rates, but I will say one of the biggest things that we're seeing that is not specifically related to fill rate that I know everyone is feeling right now um, is rising costs. Yes. Um, inflationary pressure right now, pretty much across the supply chain starting with the cost of raw material, obviously the cost of inbound freight, which I've already mentioned, services and other materials such as steel and lumber. We're seeing it across the board on outbound freight. I can tell you outbound freight rates on a per mile basis are running about 35% higher than they were this time last year. Um, so no matter where you're at, it's really gonna be hard to hide from these inflationary pressures on input costs Ultimately, what the net effect is going to be, um, companies are going to have to respond by increasing their prices to protect their margins. I doubt um, companies will be in a position to absorb all these costs, which just means that that will trickle down to consumers. And consumers ultimately are going to have to pay more for their goods and services. Uh, you couple that with the fact that we've got supply challenges. So we've got rising input costs on the one hand, we have demand outpacing supply on the other hand, when you look at things like the ISM inventory index, uh, which really measures the amount of inventory that's on hand you know, at various companies in the United States, it's at a 25 year low. That's the lowest number ever on record. And that's a public number. So basically you can expect US companies to be out of stock on goods that are in demand um, by consumers, which would include tires. Now, I can tell you some of the things that Falcon is doing to try and address the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, part of our value proposition is to be our dealer's best supplier. We want to be easy to do business with. In this market environment, that is an extreme challenge. Um, but really, you know, the test of any partnership comes when there's stress on the system. And that really tests um, how strong your partnership is with your customers, with your distributors, with your dealers. 
So a couple things that we're doing uh, to try and help the situation. Uh, one is, you know, we go to allocate our inventory in particular, you know, if we're in a scarce inventory situation, uh, we're attempting to implement what we call fair share allocation, which means we will kind of spread out the inventory based on pro rate of share of our customers so that we can protect some of our smaller and medium sized dealers. Um, so we don't have a handful of dealers basically taking all the scarce product. Um, another thing we've done kind of in the same vein is uh, we've reduced the amount of factory direct orders that we're taking and we're bringing that product into our warehouse. Um, we do have seven distribution centers in the United States. By bringing that product into the warehouse, it just gives more dealers more access to the product as opposed to being able to kind of skip the line and take it direct from the factory. Um, the third thing is holding our back orders and not fill or kill any orders. So uh, we will hold back orders for dealers if they want us to hold them. That way they don't lose their place in line when the product becomes available. Uh, and the last thing is really looking at ways to try and expedite shipping. Uh, I had mentioned that, you know, containers coming in through the ports, they may sit uh, in terminal for a while before they get on rail and then they get to the destination. There's a challenge with the chassis. All of that can add a couple of weeks of lead time. So in some cases, uh, we are expediting shipping, which means transloading product, taking it off the containers at the West Coast, moving it onto a 53 foot over the road trailer and moving that on a semi expedited service to avoid stockouts on critical products. So, you know, in talking to dealers and in dealing with these, you know, economic challenges and supply chain challenges to ensure that they have access to the product they need from you guys, from SRNA, what are you all recommending your dealers and distributors do in terms of ordering products? That's probably the most difficult question that you've asked me. <laughs> I wish I had a silver bullet for it. Um, the one thing we do know is that for suppliers, distributors, retailers, if you can't get your product on the shelf, um, and if you don't have it in stock, you have zero chance of making a sale. Mm -hmm. That's where the supply chain side of this becomes really important. Um, what can a dealer do in terms of trying to get access to the product they need? Um, hopefully, you know, in long-term planning of their supply base, they've tried to build these strategic relationships with their suppliers. Um, so that they're not caught kind of out in the market, just willy nilly uh, buying brands or trying to find supply. I think for those that do have a strategic partnership um, with us or with any supplier, they're going to have a better chance of securing that product. Um, you know, obviously, regularly evaluating your assortment of products to identify where you may have risk, where you may not be deep enough. Um, in your supply or where you mean, may need to establish those strategic partnerships um, is important. I think just staying nimble and trying to remain flexible because the reality is in some cases, you're just gonna have limited options. So in those cases, you know, your best strategy may be just diversify your supply base, especially if you're single source. Um, that doesn't go for just product, but for services as well. Uh, specifically for Falcon, you know, working closely with your account manager to identify a product is available in another location. Uh, we're pretty good about moving product around in our network. So if you're a dealer that's on the East Coast and we don't have the product there, we can definitely move it to get it closer to you um, if we have it available in some cases. If not, perhaps you can take a secondary supply alternative as an option. Uh, through one of our distributors, you may be able to sign up um, for secondary supply, but just gives you another option. In some cases, you know, if we're completely out of stock across the board and we can't get the product anywhere, you know, we're, we're just asking dealers to exercise some patience and uh, just hold their back orders. And when the product does come available, you know, make sure that they're ready to accept the order so it doesn't get reallocated to somebody else. Yeah, for sure. All, all good advice. Now, Ron, I know we, we discussed this a little bit um, at the beginning of the conversation. Um, my last question for you, I wanted to know when 
and how do you see the supply chain working itself out from pandemic shutdowns? I know you said, you know, supply and demand usually works itself out, but forecasting maybe into your crystal ball, um, when do you see this kind of, um, I guess, uh, not getting back to a normal, but getting back to where, you know, um, there's less like congestion uh, in the market and stuff like that, less delays. Yeah, that really is the million dollar question. Uh, if you had asked me this a couple months ago, I think the original estimates were that we would start to see improvement in the second quarter. That obviously hasn't come to full fruition. Uh, while we have seen some improvements, the situation as we already discussed is extremely challenging. It's far from normal in my opinion. Um, so new estimates are projecting normalization Best case in Q3, worst case estimates would be Q4. Uh, I would say those could even shift out to 2022 uh, due to what we're seeing right now with the liquidity and the economy and the economic strength. So as a general approach, I would encourage any importer that's being impacted by this to just kind of hope for the best, but you got to plan for the worst case scenario and start putting in your contingency plans now uh, which you if you haven't already done that which i'm sure most already have yeah yeah very true very true well ron i want to thank you so much for being on the podcast and for sharing all of your knowledge about this subject today i really appreciate it and um yeah thanks for coming on and being on the show absolutely